The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, this is George Orling from HGSA, and I want to welcome you to the uh, first installment of 2015 to our HGSA research webinar series. Um, today, I, I thought I'd get the, the series kick-started with a uh, general overview of all the exciting things that have gone on in uh, 2014, both within HGSA as well as globally uh, as the number of uh, academic institutions and research institutions and pharma companies around the world um, fight against HD. Sorry. One second. Okay, thank you. Um, but before we get started, sorry about that, um, for those of you who may need me new to the research webinar series, you can ask a question at any time uh, during the seminar as it comes to you. Just uh, type it in the section where it says questions, uh, click send, and at the end of the webinar, I'll go through them and try to answer as many of the questions as we have in the time allotted. Also, uh, I, you know, I recognize that this is a, a difficult time for, for many people to participate, particularly on the West Coast. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that we are recording this webinar um, so that you can view it on our website at your leisure at hgsa.org uh, backslash research webinar. Sorry, it looks like we're having some not being able to see my screen. Bear with us just one second. Let me stop and share it. Apologize for this. Oh, great. Looks like everyone can see the screen. We're good. OK. Don't know what that was all about, but sorry about that. OK, so like I said, we will be recording this webinar, and you can view it um, at your leisure on our website. Uh, just to inform you of our upcoming schedule, um, just been informed actually as today, there's a slight update in the next webinar. Instead of February 9th, which is a Monday, um, the webinar has been, will be rescheduled to Tuesday, February 10th from 11 to 12 Eastern time. Dr. Michael Hayden, um, the Chief Scientific Officer of Teva Pharmaceuticals and um, also a professor at the University of British Columbia and world expert in HD, will be, uh, is graciously giving his time to talk to the community about this very important uh, clinical trial called Pride HD that Teva is sponsoring. So hopefully um, you'll join us for that. If you've already registered, uh, no need to re-register. We will send you an updated information um, uh, later on today about the change in date. And then in March, March 19th, uh, Dr. Beth Thomas from the Scripps Research Institute will be joining us to talk about her exciting new paper uh, that just came out um, talking about uh, the inhibition of something called HDAC, in hi uh, histone deacetylase, as a potential treatment for Huntington's disease. So with that, let's just go ahead and get into it. Um, it was a very exciting year um, for HD research, and I'd like to take some time to review, uh, give you a, here's a little bit of a roadmap of what we'll be discussing. It's a, I want to talk a little bit about who's doing what in the world of worldwide um, research for Huntington's disease treatments. We'll talk a little bit about the progress we've made at HDSA in our internal research programs, uh, highlighting some 
uh, very exciting data as it relates to biomarkers as they, we prepare for clinical trials. Uh, and, and close with the importance of participating in research in trials such as Enroll HD and discuss some of the new, uh, new clinical trials that have just begun uh, in hopes of a treatment for HD. So I like to start with the presentation with a word of hope. And this is taken from Dr. Ed Wild, who I think he said these exact words at our convention last year in Louisville, Kentucky. And that is, you know, HD is the most curable, incurable disorder. And why is that? And, and I just wanted to review some of the, the things that make us as scientists and you as patients and families, you should be so um, hopeful um, that treatments can and will come. First off, we have diagnostic certainty with Huntington's disease. So the discovery of the gene over 20 years ago has led to um, very accurate genetic diagnosis. So it allows us, we know who will get Huntington's disease by genetic test. And it's a monogenetic disease, meaning all of Huntington's disease can be explained by a single gene mutation in a protein named, called Huntington. Other neurogenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, um, while there is a genetic component, it's a very small a portion of, of the disease population that has this genetic component. So they, they're left with the problem of not knowing uh, what, exactly what is causing those diseases. As you'll see, um, there is intense scientific activity going on in Huntington's disease community. For a rare disease to have the resources and the, the army of researchers and pharmaceutical companies uh, pursuing HD as a potential indication is inspiring and hopeful. Um, we have organized clinical networks around the world, both in the United States as well as in Europe and Australia and New Zealand, Canada. Um, these are a network of trial-ready clinicians uh, that are HB, HD ex experts, and they're collecting data in a very uniform manner, um, which we'll talk about as part of Enroll HD. Um, our fourth point is the clinical trials have already been completed for HD. Um, this can't be overlooked. We've, we've had success with the uh, approval of tetrabenazine for Korea associated with HD, and we will have success again. We know how to do this, and we will do it. And finally, we, we have a motivated and informed patient population. All of you are informed by participating in these, in these monthly calls. You're, you're active, and that's, that's key. Because um, we all know, and hopefully you all know, that uh, with no patients means there are no trials, which means there are no drugs for HD. Um, the current state of HD research around the world hasn't changed much. Um, I think I've used this slide last year uh, in my review of 2013. But just to recap, um, there are a number of fantastic organizations around the world, um, um, all working with the same goal in mind, and that is to rid the world of HD. Um, CHDI Foundation is a nonprofit biotechnology company um, or organization that's focused solely on HD. They don't care about any other neurodegenerative disorder. And they have um, tremendous resources that they're throwing um, at leveraging uh, at both internal drug discovery programs that they are, are creating themselves with their HD experts in-house at their sites across the, uh, the country, as well as providing external funding to both pharmaceutical companies as well as um, academic researchers. And they spend, I know this might be slightly outdated, but upwards of 100 to 120 plus million dollars a year totally dedicated to HD, which is fantastic. Within the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, there's an organization, um, a group called NINDS. This is the National Institute for Neurological Diseases and Stroke. This is the group that's responsible for funding researchers that are interested in HD. And um, their funding HD researchers is approximately $60 million per year. There are clinical study networks, as I, refer, uh, I referenced in my last slide, that are um, at the ready to assist with clinical trials, as well as some, you know, supporting some research. Uh, this is the European HD Network, or EHDN, which is funded by CHGI to support clinical trials, as well as the Huntington Study Group, or HSG, which, um, at least to my most recent count, 
They have approximately 104 different clinical research sites lo located throughout the U.S., Canada, uh, Europe, and elsewhere to um, assist pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, as they run their clinical trials. There are a number of other uh, HD organizations, nonprofit organizations, like Hereditary Disease Foundation, or HDF, as well as Huntington Society of Canada, HSC, and us, that um, all have active research programs and are doing our part um, to move the needle of HD research. This is, this is great news. This is the, what's happened in 2014 is that the number of pharma and biotech companies, um, this list just keeps on growing. Um, some drop out, but when one drops out, it seems that two take its place. So this is fantastic news that um, there are so many fantastic, recognizable, reputable pharmaceutical and biotech companies that have in some way, shape, or form are um, interested or currently pursuing HD as an indication in their business model. 2014, from a regulatory perspective, was it was a good year. Um, 2013 stunk, let's be honest. It was, um, we, the CIDR, which is the Center for uh, Drug Evaluation and Research, which is within the FDA that approves the drugs, would be approving drugs for Huntington's disease. In 2013, just approved, um, only 27 novel drugs were approved. Uh, it was pretty, a, pretty much a down year. But in 2014, we saw an increase of to 41 novel new drugs were approved by CIDR. Um, and what's really exciting is that 15 of those 41, so greater than you know, uh, 33 percent of those approvals were for rare diseases. Uh, none for Huntington's disease, but the point is um, companies and are taking a serious look and having success with rare diseases. And we hope the same will be true for Huntington's disease. This is just a, uh, an update of, I think, where we, I see our HD drug pipeline standing as of 2015. At the end of the year, we were met with some setbacks, some unfortunate news that two of the largest trials um, uh, ever undertook for combating HD, the CREST-D trial and the two-care study, which was testing coenzyme Q10, um, they were terminated due to futility, meaning the an interim analysis of their data uh, suggested that if they were continued on for the length of their trial, um, they just they weren't going to work. Um, so those studies were terminated. While it's unfortunate, um, we press on, and what should be reassuring is there are a long list of other exciting drugs that are ready to take its place in the clinical trial pipeline um, to hopefully move forward to FDA approval. And Towards the end of the year, in December uh, of 2014, we saw a press release from Auspex Pharmaceutical releasing their results from their first in ARC HD trials, which was testing a, um, a moderate, modified version of tetrabenazine for HD. And uh, the results appeared to be very promising and to have um, met their primary endpoints. So we're very, very hopeful um, uh, for those data that we will eventually see another arrow over towards FDA approval very soon. So the good news is um, with Huntington, in regards to Huntington's disease, we know what causes it. Um, the bad news is we really don't, we don't know what Huntington does. And we also don't know what uh, it does not do when you inherit the CAG repeat mutation. I don't intend, you, intend for you to read all of these. It's not the purpose of this slide. It's just to show you that um, where, we, where you see a yellow box, these are different cellular processes that researchers are building evidence against that when Huntington is, is inherited or expressed in a cell or a neuron, it screws up all of these different processes. And uh, researchers are working on each and every one of these to hopefully develop, you know, validate different proteins or DNA um, that may play a role in these processes. And by developing maybe drugs around some of these targets or proteins, um, we could modify uh, the course of HD. In addition to what we're all hoping to see is the silencing of the actual gene Huntington that causes the disease. 
So there are, we won't talk about them in, in detail today, but suffice it to say there are many different approaches in very early stages of development to correct HD, and this is just a list of some of them. Some, um, there's very exciting data coming out of Jill Bates's lab uh, in, in King's College London about potentially inhibiting myostatin in the periphery to combat HD. There's, uh, there's data to look at in, in different programs. We'll hear about from, from Beth Thomas in March about HDAC inhibition, um, ways to stimulate protein clearance, or stimulate this thing called autophagy, which literally means self-eating, to rid the body of mutant Huntington. And the list goes on and on. There's new biology being uncovered every day by the researchers around the world. One thing that was uh, released, some really exciting data that was presented at the Society for Neuroscience meeting back in November of this past year, but came from a collaboration with Sangamo Biosciences and Shire. Um, they're working together on this novel technology to lower Huntington using these things called zinc finger proteases. And we won't go into the specifics of how they work, but basically they take these zinc fingers, they're, they're able to de um, develop them to recognize CAG repeats. Um, they express them using a virus, and uh, they express these proteins using a virus, which will be you know, directly injected into the brain of either the animals in this case, but eventually into humans, um, to specifically silence the and decrease the levels of the mutant gene. And here you can see, uh, hopefully in red, these are different patient cell lines, lymphoblast cell lines. Um, the first one is just a normal patient with um, a 18 CAG repeats on both copies of their um, chromosomes. Uh, so these are, this is a normal, most unaffected HD people. Um, and you can see that the, the drug has no effect in red of, um, of inhibiting a normal CAG repeat length. However, when you lower, when you um, give the zinc finger protease or expose a cell from a patient with mutant lengths of CAG repeats, so 70, 67, 45, and 44 CAG repeat lengths, um, what you can see is this technology is able to specifically differentiate between the normal and the wild and the mutant lengths, and we can get an, a decreased expression of the mutant Huntington gene. So this is the hope, is that moving forward, um, this technology can be translated into man and specifically target the, the bad allele or bad gene of Huntington and not touch the unaffected wild type um, unexpanded gene. Because we all know that um, the, mutant, the Huntington gene has a purpose and it's a, an essential purpose for life and we don't, if we can, we don't want to uh, inhibit that. New also for 2014 was a, um, a new way to communicate to, to the people, uh, to people about uh, both what's going on internally at HCSA as well as just news events and press releases that occur throughout the community about HD. So we've partnered with a company called Aptomics to create a, a new HD news app for smartphones. And it's totally free. Um, you can find it just by going onto your iTunes or Google Play after this call. Search for HDSA is the easiest way, um, or Aptomics, and you'll find a logo. One is, uh, I think two things will come up when you search HDSA. You'll find the Hornsby District Softball Association. That is not us. Um, the other one is our little logo here. Um, you want to click on that and download this new app. And what it basically does is pulling um, feeds, news feeds from different sources, uh, both from hcsa.org. You'll get all the latest uh, releases or, or articles from the, the guys at HD Buzz, and as well as press releases and exciting stories from Medical News Today and Silent Science Daily. So if you haven't already, please check it out and download the app and stay abreast of all the, the hot new information that's coming on HD. So now I want to just take a few minutes to talk about um, the progress we've made internally at HDSA in regards to our own research programs. One, one program I have a soft spot in my heart for is, is our Don, Don King Summer Research Fellowship Program. And this program is really, um, it's set out to uh, facilitate 
getting young students, young promising scientists involved in HD research uh, to build that pipeline of researchers for the future. And uh, we, we support them to work in the lab of an established HD researcher over the course of the summer. And the, their experience culminates after the summer. Uh, in the next year, they, we invite them all to come to HGSA convention and present the findings of their work to the patients and families who they represent. Here's a list of, of our three recipients from this past year. Um, and we're very excited to welcome uh, Wenli Dai, Courtney Hanlon, and Varsha Prabhakar to uh, convention next year, or this year, um, in Dallas. This is just, uh, uh, there's one of our uh, superstar Don King fellows. This is Courtney Hanlon, and this is, um, this, this is kind of the story that we're hoping to achieve with the Don King Fellowship. Courtney was, is an aspiring, uh, she, here she is holding her NCAA championship, uh, women's ice hockey championship trophy. She's a two-time winning NCAA champion. Um, here she is in the lab working on an actual HD project um, over the course of this past summer. And we're happy to, uh, she's happy to uh, announce that she's just been accepted to the School of Medicine at Dartmouth University. So, and in talking to her, she hopes to continue her, her work in HD. So this is exactly what we set out to do or hope to achieve with this exciting uh, research program. 2014 saw us expand our, our flagship research program called the HD Human Biology Project. And I won't go through all of the, the, the what, who, when, and how of the program. It's all here. Um, but this is a research grant mechanism to provide young scientists um, postdocs, assistants, assistant professors, young um, scientists that are trying to make a name for themselves and get their first big grant to get them uh, the funding they need to kickstart their careers and hopefully a career in HD. It's open to researchers around the world. Um, and in fact, you don't have to be a scientist to apply, so innovative ideas from non-scientists are accepted. Um, the point of and the goal of this program is to, as the name implies, you're working to understand the biology of Huntington's disease in humans. There are lots of different models out there, um, animal models of HD ranging from worms and flies and mice and rats and monkeys and uh, mini pigs uh, and sheep. There's tons of models. Uh, unfortunately, none of those models get HD. Only humans get HD. And the pro purpose of this program is to understand the disease in humans. And this example shown here is just a recent paper um, uh, showing that, you know, mice can often mislead. And of 603 drugs tested in mice for stroke, not HD, but for stroke, they found that, in fact, 374 of those drugs helped the brain in some way in different stroke models in mice. However, when 97 of those 374 made it into humans, um, only one worked. And the one that did work wasn't, didn't go into humans because of success in a, in a mouse trial. It went into humans because of success in a separate human trial. So it kind of drills home the point of we really, to, get our, our, to mo have the most physiologically uh, relevant data, we need to be looking in the people that get HD, and uh, that's what this program aims to do. In, I guess it was uh, October and into November, we announced um, our latest recipients of the Human Biology Project, and here are eight of them. Um, all of their summaries of their work and their projects are all can be all be found on hdsa.org. Um, what I want to point out is that some of these these there were, some of these researchers are, are reliant on the patients and families out there, all of you, um, in particular, like this one with Dr. Don Lowe at UCLA, where they'll be um, putting activity watches and, and monitoring sleep and circadian cycles of HD patients in their home, um, remote testing to try to un understand what goes wrong in the sleep patterns, the circadian rhythm patterns of HD patients. So um, these are studies that you can actually participate in. Um, and play a role in. So, uh, and hopefully in the, in the coming months, we'll actually have a, a forum um, in which we can, you can connect with those people through a new research um, 
clinical trial website that we're in the process of developing. Those, we originally had a press release that we had eight um, human biology projects. Our scientific advisory board meets every September, and we go through all of the uh, human biology projects. And we determined that of all of the applicants, uh, applications, there were nine proposals that if HCSA had the support, we deem them as we, we should be funding them immediately. They were that important. Uh, and at the last minute, we found, thanks to the, the generosity of a, a family foundation, we were able to support the ninth human biology project, um, Dr. Daniel Wilton from Children's Hospital of Boston, where he'll be working with um, Dr. Beth Stevens on a project in looking at complements. Um, which is involved in the immune, immune response. And they're also partnered with a company called the Nexon Biosciences, where they'll be testing these antibodies that will block complement, block the immune response as a potential treatment for HD. So we're very excited that we were able to uh, provide the necessary support to get, um, to facilitate some of these very important studies in human samples. The work's continuing. This is just a list of our 2013 uh, human Biology Project fellows, and, and these researchers are making tremendous progress. I just want to highlight briefly the work from um, um, IRBM Promitus, which is a biotech company in Italy, that we're supporting to de develop a, a test or an assay to detect full-length mutant Huntington in body fluids of HD patients. So these, this is a biomarker, and they're absolutely critical for clinical trial success as we move forward. So before I get started in that, I just want to review for people, you'll hear the word biomarker a lot. Just take a minute to define really what a biomarker is. It's, it's something that can be objectively measured and evaluated as a, uh, it's an indicator of some process, some biological process or pathogenic process in response to an intervention, whether it's a drug or a therapy. Um, and they're, they're very helpful signposts to scientists and clinicians along the way that what you're doing is modifying the disease, impacting the disease in some way. There's lots of types of things that can be biomarkers. So there's fluid biomarkers, so things in the blood, saliva, cerebral spinal fluid, which we'll talk about in a minute. That's also referred to as CSF. Um, there's, uh, there's imaging biomarkers. You'll hear things uh, and work is being done on using MRI, and CAT scans, and PET scans to um, figure out what's image inside the brain of HD patients. There's electrophysiological measures, so like measuring electricity within the, in the people, um, as well as physiological measures, such as like the movements of eyes and strength and uh, motor function in patients. So one of the biomarkers that's absolutely critical as we move forward to um, hopefully seeing the dawn of Huntington lowering therapies in the clinic is that um, none of these trials will proceed without a test to measure the amount of Huntington present in a person. So we can, give a, we can give a drug that we hope will lower Huntington in the brain of HD patients, but we, you don't want us to go into, and we can't go in and take, figure out if the Huntington gene is, is being lowered by taking a little portion of your brain. That's not something that we can or want to do, or you'd want us, anyone to do. So we need innovative ways to figure out that when a drug is delivered to the brain to lower Huntington, that is actually working. So one way to do it is use PET scan, and that's shown in the upper right. This is work that's been really pioneered in the Alzheimer's field um, using a compound called Pittsburgh compound. Um, and similar things are being done for HD. So to try to detect the protein using a ligand or a, a drug, a radioactive drug, that will light up and Hopefully you can see, uh, you know, when you give a drug, pretend this is Huntington lit up in orange and yellows. When you give a Huntington-lowering drug, we should be, hopefully see a decrease in the signal of the Huntington protein. Alternatively, there's, uh, we hope that there's detection of the Huntington protein in cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. And that's what uh, IRB and Permitus is working with us, or working to do. And they've reported exciting data in 2014 that what they're doing appears, you know, preliminarily to work. First off, they've developed an assay to, um, that they can actually differentiate at very, very low levels um, a Huntington protein with normal repeats, with 19 repeats, versus something with a uh, 
CAG repeat length of um, reminiscent of Huntington's disease, shown here as 46 repeats. So their assay can detect normal in mutant. Fantastic. Um, one of their next steps then is to see, look into uh, human materials. And this, these are two separate pilot studies done at uh, University College of London, as well as University of British Columbia using uh, frozen CSF samples. And what we can see is um, as we can measure mutant Huntington protein in patient CSF, and it appears that the levels increase in the manifest and pre-manifest patients CSF versus the unaffected controls. So we're hopeful that we can develop, uh, refine this assay and you'll be able to um, you know, easily detect mutant Huntington in CSF of uh, HD patients and that when Huntington is lowered in the brain that we will see a uh, concomitant decrease in Huntington in, uh, in the CSF of patients. So it's, CSF is kind of like a giving us a window into the brain as to what's going on with Huntington. So it's very, very exciting stuff um, that um, we're very excited to be a part of. In February of 2014, HDSA made a very um, unprecedented move. That is, the Board of Trustees made a, a unprecedented move. And that was to formally endorse a clinical research study. Um, and in February, we endorsed the Enroll HD study. What is Enroll HD? It's a lot of things. It's, it is a, it's an observational, it's a global, uh, longitudinal, meaning over time, observational study of Huntington's disease. It's also a, a research platform where we and, and uh, CHGI, who are um, overseeing this project, uh, believe that all future HD clinical trials will be uh, it'll be a springboard for them, where we hope that they'll begin. Um, HD, Enroll HD also is a biorepository. It's collecting not only a common set of data for participants around the world, it's also collecting blood samples for DNA and cell lines um, so that we can better understand HD. And these cell lines and materials will um, be placed in a biorepository, I believe in Italy, which will then be made available to researchers freely around the world so to answer their, to, you know, to allow them to ask questions in patient materials um, and test hypotheses what they believe is going on um, in HD is actually true in the human population. So very, very exciting um, and potentially um, real potential game changer in the field of Huntington's research and drug discovery. What's involved in an enrolled visit? Well, it's, it's just one annual visit. Um, you'll ask, answer questions about your health, such as how you're thinking, your behaviors, your lifestyle, your quality of life. We have a neurologic exam, like you probably, you know, HD patients and families already uh, go through. Uh, there'll be a blood sampling for genotyping, for testing for the, um, the mutation, but you, you know, you don't know your, if you don't, you don't know your, your genetic status. And there will be materials, which is optional for biobanking, meaning, you know, putting into a, a repository for, for helping researchers down the road. Um, typically the first visit's about, is a little longer, but uh, from what I gather from talking to people, the, the visit is around, typical visit is anywhere from one to two hours, and travel support's available. The beauty of Enroll HD is um, when we ask who can participate, anyone can participate. It is a truly a family study. Uh, so the gene positive, the symptomatic or pre-symptomatic are welcome and, and encouraged to uh, join. Genes, those who prefer not to know their gene status but just simply at risk uh, can enroll. Those that have gone through the testing process and know they're not at risk anymore and they're gene negative can enroll as well as spouses and partners and caregivers. Um, to serve as controls are all welcome to enjoy, are all welcome to participate, not enjoy, I'm sorry. Um, there are three main goals of this, this project or, or platform. The first is to understand, help us better understand HD um, and help us find some of the factors that influence progression. The only way, you know, there's a lot of questions out there about, well, how come I have, you know, 40 CAG repeats and I got Huntington's disease, I became symptomatic at 30 and my brother has 40 CAG repeats and 
he didn't become symptomatic till he was 60. Well, um, tapping into a large patient population um, will allow researchers to better understand which factors, which genetic modifiers are out there that are playing a role in influencing the progression of the disease. And we need large, large numbers of patients to do these types of studies to get a, a better feel for the, 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 the genes, the DNA, the, the genetic modifiers that are playing a role in that progression of HD. Because the CAG repeat length is a factor in when you'll see an onset of symptoms, but it's not the only factor. And there are other things at play, and we need to figure them out. Because once we figure them out, what those genes are, they're potential drug targets that pharmaceutical companies could then um, design drugs to um, inhibit or activate to hopefully modify the disease. Enroll HD will also hopefully foster good clinical care uh, by tracking how HD patients are um, provided care around the world. This is a global platform. Um, we hope that we'll see trends that will uh, inform clinicians and the community of ways to better um, treat uh, HD patients. And finally, Enroll HD will hopefully enhance and, uh, the design and, and speed up the conduct of future HD clinical trials. There's been, um, since it got kicked off a couple of years ago, we've seen a real dramatic increase in the number of Enroll HD participants in the past year and a half or so. Um, and as of today, latest count, we're now up to, um, we're seeing over 4,400 participants around the world in 98 different sites are participating. Um, the goal is by the end of this year to have nearly or more than 200 sites open and currently and recruiting uh, patients with the goal of within, I believe it's over five years, to have this number in the range of 25 to 30,000 people, um, HD affected or impacted individuals as part of this Enroll HD platform. So if I can wrap up Enroll, what is Enroll? To me, it's a magnet. It's a magnet for the, all of these pharmaceutical companies. They've come to the HD party. They want to participate. Um, the first question out of their mouths when they think they might have an asset or a drug that um, may play a role in, or, or positively uh, affect symptoms or disease progression of HD, the first question out of their mouth is, where are the patients so that we can do a, a quick trial, an efficient trial? Um, and we as a community need to be ready. And Enroll is where those patients, patients will be. And it, it'll, we hope, will be a magnet to bring these companies to us and not let them leave because we'll have a, a, a um, registry of patient uh, of, of trial-ready participants ready for their trials. So finally, I um, just want to talk about the news and, the, and uh, the wave of new clinical trials that has begun in HD. Um, before I start, I, in talking to some people, it was, I, you know, I wanted to just define what clinical research or clinical trials actually are. Um, I've had conversations where um, they said, I thought this drug was already in clinical trials. It cured a mouse of Huntington's disease. Well, you know, putting a drug in a mouse is not a clinical trial. That is the left-hand side of research, which is preclinical, before humans. So there's types of preclinical research are in vitro, which is like in cells and test tubes, our neurons, and then in vivo, which is in, in mice or animals. Um, so seeing results that are, you know, affecting, positively affecting um, a Huntington model in cells or in a mouse or in a monkey is not clinical research. Clinical research involves humans, and there's two types of trials. Observational, which is you know, looking at diagnosis or natural history or looking for biomarkers, very similar to what we just talked about in Enroll HD. And then there's interventional, which is, you know, with a drug, with a therapy, some sort of intervention to um, modify the disease, and that's what we're talking about, interventional clinical trials. Um, we, show, we show up that. We saw this slide before. This is the, the HD pipeline, and as I mentioned, um, there's, while two trials ended, um, we got great results from Auspex Pharmaceuticals in December of this past year on their drug, SD809, 
um, which is a, uh, also known as, uh, will be known as Osteto. Um, and these are the phase three, the final pivotal uh, clinical trial for, these, for this drug, showing that um, the drug had a very significant um, and positive effect on TMC, which is total maximal chorea, which is just a, a subscore within the UHDRS rating scale. So that was their primary endpoint. And as you can see, that the drug compared to placebo had over two and a half point um, improvement for a, a p-value of, of 0 0.0001, very significant improvement. And this is just a picture of, of the approved drug xenazine um, or tetrabenazine that's out there and marketed for, for Korea. Um, SD-809 or dutetrabenazine looks very similar. The only difference are that these H's or hydrogens have been modified to deuterium um, atoms, which are just um, basically hydrogens that are made a little heavier by adding extra uh, neutrons to their nucleus. So they're slightly radioactive, nothing to worry about. We have de uh, deuterium in our bodies. Uh, all of us do. Um, but by making these simple modifications, it appears to alter the way that the drug uh, is metabolized by the human body in such a way, too, that it appears to have fewer side effects. And I won't go through all of these, but you can see that, um, you know, in particular, the incidence of depression in people taking SD-809 compared to placebo was, um, there was no difference. Uh, as opposed to, this was something that was always a concern, is a concern with uh, tetrabenazine or xenazine, the increased incidence of depression versus placebo. Um, when taking xenazine. So I don't, I'm not sure the field expected these results, but they're very welcome and exciting results nonetheless. So it's my understanding that as, as uh, OSPEX is working hard to uh, submit a NDA, a new drug application, to the FDA uh, later this year with hopes of getting rapid um, approval from the FDA. So very exciting. 2014 saw Teva Pharmaceuticals, um, who we'll hear from Dr. Michael Hayden next month about, um, jump into the HD arena with a, something called the Pride HD study. Pride, uh, Pride HD is testing a drug called Pridopidine, also known as Hemtexel or ACR16, which Teva acquired from a company called Neurosearch. Neurosearch ran these trials years ago. Um, they were called the Heart and Mermaid studies. Um, and they actually saw improvement um, in total motor score in these studies in HD patients. However, total motor score was not the primary um, readout for those trials. And um, so they, we have to go back to the drawing board a little bit and um, do some dose finding in this particular study. And that's what Pride HD is doing. They're testing um, <coughs> five different doses, 45, 67 and a half, 90, and 112.5 milligrams twice a day. Um, over the course of 26 weeks in HD patients. And they need uh, approximately 400 subjects. They're going to track the change in total motor score in these patients. And we expect, or they hope, to have um, completion of recruitment early in 2015. Teva is taking a second shot on goal. And they have a, with a, a trial called Legato, which is just ramping up now. Legato is also the Laquinamod study. Laquinamod is basically like an anti-inflammatory drug for the brain. Um, this is going to be a global study run by both EHDN and HSG. Um, and this is a drug that's already been in the clinic for multiple sclerosis, or MS, and they're testing it out in HD. There's this idea, and there are, there are human data suggests that um, HD is effect, immune, uh, the immune system is, is upregulated in HD, and that by Providing anti-inflammatory will have clinical benefit to HD patients. This is also recruiting. Um, there'll be uh, over a 12-month study. They'll need 400 subjects. So it just got underway at the end of last year, but you'll be hearing a lot about that in 2015 uh, as they ramp up the recruitment and um, recruitment efforts. CHDI Foundation is working uh, closely with Pfizer um, in moving something called a PDE10 inhibitor forward for HD. PDE stands for phosphodiesterase. And Pfizer has made a, a quite a living on drugs that inhibit this, these types of enzymes called phosphodiesterases. 
most uh, commonly known is, is for Pfizer is Viagra, which is a phosphodiesterase, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor. Um, so there's, there's idea. These, these drugs have been around for a while, and they originally developed for uh, schizophrenia. But the, there's data to suggest that the inhibition of this enzyme, PDE10, appears to improve nerve cell function uh, in HD animal models. So uh, a study was, a phase two study was uh, initiated in 2013 in Paris. And a new study um, is going to, has begun, called the Amaryllis study, which is a phase two study. Uh, which will have study sites in the U.S., Canada, U.K., Germany, and Poland. Um, and a number, 270 subjects will be needed for this half-year study where they'll be testing two different doses of the Pfizer drug. Um, and just like the Laquinamod and the Pride HD study, their primary endpoint will be total motor score, but they'll also be looking at the impact of this Pfizer drug on other endpoints such as chorea, cognition, behavior, as well as some brain imaging uh, readouts using MRI. Um, the most, you know, some of the most exciting news and promising things that we, we heard about were that um, ISIS and Roche, ISIS Pharmaceuticals and Roche are, are moving their antisense oligonucleotides towards the clinic. Um, these, they're planning a small phase 1B, which is a safety study, merely a safety study in HD patients for the first half of this year on their drug ISIS Huntington RX. Um, this drug is a, this ASO, or antisense oligonucleotide, is, will lower both normal and mutant Huntington. So it is not allele selective. Their work, you know, further down the line, we hope to see allele selective uh, ASOs. And um, while we, this will be delivered via lumbar puncture, so intrathecally, um, and while we have no clinical site information at this time, as we hear more about this trial and know more about it, we will certainly be sharing it as we I know, all know that the community is very anxious to hear about the progress and success of ISIS and Roche on this endeavor. There are other additional HD studies undergoing around the world. Uh, DBSHD or deep brain, deep brain stimulation is a 40 patient study being done in Europe to, uh, by Jan Vesper in Dusseldorf to study the usefulness of deep brain stimulation, electrical stimulation of a region in the brain for modulating the symptoms of HD. This is something that's been around for a quarter of a century for Parkinson's disease, and it's really um, being tested now to see of its usefulness in HD patient population. There's a pivotal and very critical study going on at the University of Iowa under, uh, under the uh, guidance of Technopolis, uh, the Kids HD and JH, Kids JHD study, where it's an observational study of children. We really need to understand in, when the hunting thing gets expanded, what goes wrong first? And this study will help us figure that out. Uh, HD cell is a, a future clinical study that we hope to see begin soon, which will test the efficacy, sorry, to test the safety of mesenchymal stem cells as basically a delivery vehicle for um, growth factors or, or fertilizer for the brain, such as uh, BDNF. Um, these are being run by, at the University of California, Davis, uh, by Dr. Vicki Wheelock and Jan Nolta. So um, we're hopeful and excited to see what becomes of HD cell. And finally, there are other companies that are running, uh, have PDE10A inhibitors, similar to Pfizer's drug. Um, we may have seen in the news that Omeros recently announced in October that they suspended their phase two clinical trial for HD. Um, they're looking into uh, some strange results observed in a high, at the high dose of this drug in a rat study. Um, so the study has been suspended, but we are hopeful that um, this and others will um, be reinitiated soon. And as we hear more, we'll certainly share that with the community. So finally, I just want to close up with, you know, with a call to action. You know, what can we do to help? This is, uh, we're at a pivotal time. And uh, what I encourage you to, uh, in the future to do is to, um, we'll be enroll in HD and join Enroll HD. Um, download our, our, our HD news app, stay on top of the latest news, consult Different websites such as ACS Day, the Huntington Study Group, and clinicaltrials.gov for any HD trial details. Um, and, and just remember that no drug uh, to treat HD will ever be approved without clinical trials. So we really, really need uh, worldwide participation in this endeavor. One thing we're trying to do to make this easier for the community, and, and it's not finished yet, but I'll give you a snapshot of 
a new resource I'd like to provide to the community in the coming weeks is called the HDSA HD Trial Finder. This will be a web-based um, uh, search engine uh, that will reside at hdsa.org where you'll be able to create an account, um, create a short profile, answer a questionnaire, and be delivered uh, via the computer your match results for clinical trial um, sites and clinical trials that are in your area that you are a candidate for. Um, and provide all the necessary contact information um, so that you can reach out and get involved. Um, this is a work in progress, and we hope to, uh, as this becomes a, uh, an active resource, uh, we will certainly be um, providing some more information about this useful tool. So with that, I, I'd like to wrap up. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type them in now, and I'll try to answer um, as many as you can, as I can in the next few minutes. Um, so one, one question is about the um, UC Davis stem cell study. Where is that on the HDSA page? Um, we, are, we are tracking that, and we are happy to provide an uh, have reached out to the organization UC Davis to provide information to the community about pre-cell and HD cell, um, um, but we have not put that on our website because we're waiting on some more information from the organi organizers. Um, I have found that eating food helps to reduce my chorea. Why? Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, uh, just maybe, uh, I'm not a clinician, so I, I don't uh, care to even try to answer that question, but um, just eating and staying, um, staying fed and then getting enough calories will hopefully make you, uh, put you in a better state, hopefully make you, provide you energy and feel better. Um, but definitely talk to your doctor about that. Um, okay. Um, okay. What about, there's a question, a very informed question, just wondering where's prana? What about prana? Um, as you may know, prana had a, has a drug called PBT2 that was uh, in the clinic on a trial named REACH to HD, if I remember correctly, um, that recently ended, and it showed a, um, at least a glimmer of, of efficacy in, in a particular, uh, particular readout. Um, and my understanding is that in, uh, Prana is talking about what their next trial will be. Um, so we ha when we have more, um, they're potentially planning another trial. We don't know exactly what that trial will look like, or where it will be, and exactly when it will start, but we are tracking them, and as soon as we know more about Prana and, and their future trial, PBT2, we'll let you know. Um, can we enroll in one of these clinical trials? Um, absolutely. Um, you know, so, but what I recommend you do, any of these clinical trials, is um, check out HCSA website, um, and right now you can go on our website and click on a map in the state that you live in. Um, it's not great, but it, it has the information for these sites or for these trials where you can actually um, get some information for a study coordinator. Call them up. It's best that you reach out to them and let them determine if you are a candidate or not for a particular, uh, particular study. Um, is there anything that can be learned by HD with blindness being cured by gene replacement? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. It's a great question. Um, but I think all of these, the, the point of this is, is all of these studies, that whether it's blindness or it, they all kind of uh, are testing things that will be similar in terms of, you know, way they're injected or the, the actual drug that can, uh, the results of which can inform other diseases. And just like we hope, we're hopeful that um, you know treatments for HD will help inform Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and ALS. Um, there's certainly things that um, 
we can learn from successes and failures of other drug treatments, such as um, you know, gene therapy for gene placement for blindness. Um, some of these I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure about, um, but in order to, for someone to participate in Enroll HD, does the patient have does the patient have medical insurance and utilize this, or are they are they out of pocket costs? No, your insurance company will will never even should never even know that you're participating in, in Enroll HD, and there are no costs to you to to participate. So um, there there are no costs, and this is not something that should go in your record. So. One here question is, is the, try to answer this one, uh, the use of a placebo in a gene silencing trial is inhuman and only makes sense when the cause of the disease uh, is unknown. We must change the current scientific protocol. Why can't the control be different doses, dosages? Uh, the use of biomarkers should make a placebo obsolete. Will you work to make this change? Um, so, yeah, and I think that, um, you know, it's a great point, and um, I think that my understanding with the, I don't know the details of what ISIS and Roche have planned for their first, that'll be the first gene silencing, um, uh, gene silencing clinical trial for HD, and there's, we're not exactly sure what their protocol is going to be, but um, their first study in safety is not studying it in, in controls. It's actually do a phase 1B and studying it in HD patients. So um, it's possible that they're planning a, um, a gene silencing study in just HD patients. So um, stay tuned. Um, there's one more that I, I think I, I missed, and I, I'm actually not that familiar with, and uh, it's you missed in the pipeline, SOM3355 from SOM Biotech, which is in, is in clinical proof of concept phase 2A study right now. Thank you for pointing that out to me. I'll put it on my radar. It's not um, not something I'm that aware of, but um, I'll definitely uh, take a look at it and for future um, do my research and, and try to reach out to that company to get some more information. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, finally, um, can I be tested for HD using Enroll HD? Well, you will be genotyped, but uh, there's no, you know, there's no genetic screening component. You won't find out what those results are. So, you'd have to um, suggest you talk to a genetic counselor and go through the uh, g a genetic testing process that way, and not as part of Enroll HD. Um, so I. I think that's it. I apologize if I missed a question, but we are at 1 o'clock and I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Um, please, if I did miss a question or if you think of something after the fact, here is my email address. It's gyorling at hdsa.org. Um, feel free to email me and if I, I'll try my best to answer it. And if I can't, I'll find an expert around the world that uh, can answer it for me. So. Um, with that, I'll close and thank you very much for, for your time and I hope you'll join us on February 10th at 11 a.m. Eastern for our next research webinar from Dr. Hayden where he'll talk about the, uh, the important PRIDE HD study. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day.